Welcome to the 1000 Hours Outside podcast. My name is Jimmy Urich. I'm the founder of 1000 Hours Outside, and I'm here with an author who has uh, greatly impacted my own parenting, Kim John Payne. Welcome to the 1000 Hours Outside podcast. Thanks, Jimmy. It's lovely to be with you. It really is. Yes, I'm just so thrilled. It's it's really um the biggest deal if you have read a book and and i've had yours i mean it's dirty on the cover this is simplicity parenting i've had it for about a decade using the extraordinary power of less to raise calmer happier and more secure kids this is just one of eight of your books um, but this one in particular is dog-eared i mean i have gone back to this one so much and it is mm-hmm. um it is just I mean, I can't even tell you how exciting it is and to, to be able to sit across from you and, and to express my gratitude um, for your book and, and to have a conversation with you. Um, let me give a little bit of your bio. Um, Kim is a consultant and trainer to more than 60 U.S. independent public schools. Uh, you've been a school counselor, an adult educator, a consultant, a researcher, an educator for, for 30 years, a private family counselor for more than 15 years. You give keynote addresses around the world um, to educators, parents, therapists. You run workshops and training sessions. You are really helping so many people, uh, children's, adoles- children, adolescents, families. Um, You talk about school difficulties, siblings, classmates, attention and behavioral issues, emotional issues such as defiance, aggression, addiction, and low self-esteem. And then you're also a partner for the Alliance uh, for Childhood in Washington, D.C. You just, you're really impacting, I mean, all over the world. Trying. We're doing our best, aren't we? Yeah. Um, You're born in Australia. Yeah, and and currently are in New England. Yeah, that's it. Yep, I yeah. live on a I live on a farm up in the the mountains of New England, uh, right on the border of Massachusetts and Vermont. Okay, well, it sounds beautiful. Well, could you tell us a little bit about um, how you became interested in you know this this topic of children and and helping them um, you know have a precious childhood. It's a, it's a it's a like like for so many of us, life doesn't go in a straight line. It kind of it, it just meanders on around like it like a like a like a mountain stream. Um, for me, it began this journey began when I was working with uh, teenagers in a group home. I was, at the time, I was studying uh, psychology at college, and I always hasten to add, and I'm okay now. I've recovered from psychology studies, and. Um, the, uh, I was working in a group home uh, for kids who'd had very, very hard lives. And I was attending lectures during the day and working in the, in the home at night. And I, there was a fascinating, really very fascinating um, lecturer there who'd been a doctor or a medic actually in the Second World War and a long, long way back. And he had been then a, a doctor, graduated in the Korean and Vietnam Wars and he was talking about what was becoming known as post-traumatic stress disorder. So, um, and I kept, as he was talking about symptoms of this, I kept thinking, well, that's, oh my gosh, that's Deborah back at the group home. Oh, that's Jamie. Oh, that's Alistair. Oh, that's John. That, you know, that's Jack. And and yet he was talking about combat veterans. And I was thinking about the kids in my, my group home. And I thought, what? They, but they're not combat veterans. What, what's going on here? You know, it was just that sort of uh, that 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 thought that won't leave you. You know, and he he talked about combat veterans who weren't doing so well, um, who were nervous, jumpy, hyper vigilant, uh, were very over controlling, um, and I just kept thinking of the individual children and teenagers that I was working with. And it really, that, you know, it's interesting, Jenny, because that really set me on a path because after I'd finished uh, training, I'd finished my, 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 my uh, training in college, I volunteered, I, I traveled and then volunteered in Southeast Asia and worked in various situations, inner city situations, uh, refugee situations, uh, just post Vietnam War and the Thai Cambodian refugee camps and lots of different places. Yeah. Um, and there were nervous, jumpy, hyper controlling, uh, um, uh, uh, very um, 
are overly vigilant kids, kids who would startle at anything new, uh, kids who are in now what we well known as uh, we know now as, as fight or flight um, or freeze or flock. I, I said those two. Um, and but you, but I could get my head around it because these were kids escaping war. All right. So I remembered back what Dr. Taylor had said at, at, at university. And I was all the time I was corresponding with him and um, saying, here's what I'm seeing, that these are children, you know, because my interest has always been with children and families. These are children. These are not not soldiers. And he kept saying, look into this, think about it, explore it, take take notes, keep a journal. Wow. And so I, I, I did. I highly respected him. So I did trying to and I had no answer to it, to be honest, absolutely no answer, just observations which I think in some ways is a good place to begin. Um, and I decided at his urging to study this further. So the only course I could find uh, was in London in the UK, because back then studies into what we now know as trauma were very few and far between. In fact, they didn't really exist much. You had to kind of put it together yourself. So, the, so where this little story, uh, uh, little thread, um, uh, in one way, the chapter ends is that in moving to London, I was studying back in the time of microfiche, Jenny. Do you remember microfiche? Or are you no. too young? You know, but we, we, we no computers, um, no. Or, or actually not none, but, but not available just for ordinary use, um, microfiche and so on. Um, uh, and um, there I set up a little counseling practice just west of London. And through the door came typical kids from typical, you know, racial, like mixed racial backgrounds, mixed economic backgrounds, just, just kids yeah. um, and their families. Only they were nervous, jumpy, hypervigilant, over controlling. They were just like the kids I, I, I had been with in my group home who had been abused and very badly treated. They were just like the kids in a wartime area. But here were kids from very typical, a very typical life. And they, they for all the world, looked like wartime kids. Mm. It wow. was perhaps a little, a few notches turned down, but they were certainly on, on that spectrum. They were on that, that path. And it was, you can imagine, it was actually quite disturbing um, uh, uh, because I thought this, no, no, yeah, I've learned Shocking, that I would imagine. Fairly yeah. shocking. Yes, yes. And I held... I held the thought, the observation at arm's length because it was too big. Yeah. It was too big a thought. But, you know, like a lot of those things that come up in all our lives when they just keep returning, they just keep returning and returning. And I thought, well, okay, let's start looking at this. And so because I was studying it and I had good uh, and wise people around me, I kept checking in with them. And what it was, it was, I just got lucky in one way as I happened to catch the start of when brain imaging equipment was becoming available for psychological studies, uh, particularly in the postgrad stuff that I was doing. Now, I didn't have access to it personally, um, but the, the studies were starting to come out about the amygdala, you know, and about fight, flight, freeze or flock. Um, studies were starting to come out that the, the amygdala had um, an accumulative memory. And, and that really was formative because you see what I started to, to um, basically see is that these kids, they hadn't been in war, they hadn't been ostensibly abused, but what, had, what was happening is that they were living in the undeclared war on childhood. There was just too much, too soon, too sexy, too young, but it had become normalized. And so um, what was happening for them w was that the, um, the stress that they were experiencing was cumulative wow. and they were in a, a perpetual moderate grade state, not a high level state like the kids in, in, in war zones, but a moderate like amber. It wasn't necessarily red, <clears throat> but it was very, <clears throat> it was very difficult for them to return to a green, so to speak. They were in an amber state of high alert for much of the time because they, <clears throat> their systems, <clears throat> excuse me, their systems were being overwhelmed with the pace of modern life 
that had become, as I mentioned, normalized, and they were in a overwhelm reaction. Wow. So that that wow, you was pieced tough. it together. You well, pieced that's, together that's, what was that's what we do right in life when is is that we we join the dots. Yeah. Or we attempt to, you know, we we join. I had no answers for it yet. Uh, we can come to that in a moment, but uh, perhaps, but but that was certainly the observation. Mm -hmm. um, so with that observation that stress can be cumulative, it doesn't have to be just a series of small life-threatening events. Neurologically, children can be in a state of, of hyper alert and of overwhelm, or the overwhelm comes first and then the hyper alert, uh, through now what we call the pace of modern life. And, and you've got to remember, this was back in the 80s. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> That's what I keep thinking. I keep thinking, you know, your book was so influential for me. I read it in the early, you know, in the 2000, about 10 years ago, I read your book. Um, you know, but even the change since 10 years ago, and then you're talking about decades ago, um, you know, the pressures on childhood are just tremendous. It's, it's almost exponential. What I think we're um, for the first time in human evolution, the, um, the, uh, the amygdala that I mentioned, the fight or flight, the reptilian brain, it's sometimes referred to, for the first time in human evolution, that part of our brain is, is actually enlarging. Its activity is enlarging, but actually enlarging in size. That has never happened before. That has never happened before. And I asked a friend of mine uh, um, who is a professor at, you know, of, of um at neurology of evolutionary neurology uh, in Colorado, I said to her, you know, the brain is very plastic, right? For children, this would adapt, wouldn't it adapt? And she said, hmm, that's an interesting question. Let me just, I'll, 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 I'll look into that. She got back to me in two weeks and said, you know, the answer is kind of yes and no, but um, do you want the good news or the bad news? And I said, all the good news. And she said, well, yes, it, it, it would. And she said, I said, thank you. She said, don't you want the bad news? I said, no, not really. Um, and she said, the, <laughs> the, the bad news is that um, if we capped the level of increasing stress in children's lives today, if we stopped it today, and of course we can't, it's increasing and increasing. Um, most 12, she took the normative data of 12 year olds. She said, most 12 year olds would, their brain would be adapted if they live 900 years without any further stress. So in other words, we've got 900 years ahead of our kids' ability as a society to cope with what we're throwing at them. Wow. We, we've, it, we've gotten wildly, what's the saying in America, to near, uh, out of whack? <laughs> yes, that's it. That's we've got it. wildly, yes. wildly out of whack. Mm -hmm. So there, so therefore, right, there's a, there's a big therefore here. It's like, okay, so what do we do? You know, what, mm -hmm. what in the face of that is, as a, as a mom or a dad, as, as, as I am, you know, I'm a dad, like, what, what, do you, what do you do in the face of that? And for me, the, the answer was, was simply simplify. Like, if, 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 if stress can be cumulative, if it can build up over time, and have this this very um, it, it triggering effect on children's behavior, yeah. on children's feeling of safety and security, that they're not safe, they're not secure, and therefore they have to go into survival mode, which relates to a bunch of behavioral problems, yeah. um, a bunch of diagnoses. Um, then what about if we if we simply dialed it back what about if we unstressed children yeah in whatever way we could you know and you and, have, and, right you have so many yeah. ideas of that in your book I, I, can i throw out that you talk about this in your book because i think I, this is one of my top 5 like i always talk about what are the books that parents should read you know i think that you know yours is one of those ones that you know, that every family should read. I mean, there's so much in there, but you talk about, and you call it cumulative stress re reaction, CSR. So I just want parents to know that you, you talk about this and really explain it as, 
a pattern of constant small stresses that this threshold of stress builds but rarely dissipates. It's not a, a traumatic event, but frequency and consistency of small stresses. And so what, what might that look like for a child? You know, what does it, what does a series of small stresses look like um, that are not traumatic, but are, but are frequent and consistent? Well, you know, as a baseline for this, um, and in further studies that I've done, you know, academically more sort of rigorous studies as, as, as the years have gone on, I think I can kind of nutshell this in the sense of to say that all children are quirky, right? They've all got their quirks. It makes them lovable and kind of infuriating sometimes, but mm -hmm. that's their quirk. Um, so they might be just a very busy child, you know, just very, very busy, always looking for things to do. Um, they might be a child who's very organized, just likes things to be organized in their own quirky way, because you look at it and think, seriously, that's organized, but for them it is, right? Um, now, if you add cumulative stress to their lives, where there's just too many books, too many toys, too many, uh, too little uh, rhythm and predictability, too many play dates, too much scheduling, and a big one is too much adult information and screen based information. And we can back up on that in a moment, but just to name those big four, um, the, the, what happens is that, that that little quirk starts to become inflamed. And I think of that as a soul fever, an emotional fever. It starts to become inflamed. And as it becomes inflamed, that quirk becomes inflamed. It starts moving from just being a, their lovable little person <clears throat> into being problematic so that the very active child starts to become agitated. The very organized child starts to become mm, stubborn and uh, the, the very feisty child, just lovely little, little fiery one starts to really push back really very, very, very hard consistently. Now, if the cumulative stress continues and, and it's so hard, Jimmy, because this is the new normal. Yeah. We've got to be very intentional if we want to do anything about this. But um, if the stress continues, then it, it doesn't just become problematic anymore. Um, the, the playing with siblings just doesn't become antsy and disruptive. And, um, and, and you know it's more, it's not them. You know that something is... You know when your kids have yeah. got a fever or they're 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 they've got a low grade fever or they're headed towards a fever and their behavior is antsy and they're off their food a little bit. This is on a physical level. Yeah. <clears throat> and we think, oh boy, what okay, here we go. Here's a fever cooking. We all know that as mums or dads. And then sure enough, two o'clock in the morning, mom, you know, like it's why is it always two o'clock? Anyway, the um but the <laughs> <laughs> but you know and they're getting and they're sick and they're shivery and yeah. they're you know and so on we know when they're about to get a physical fever because their their immune system is 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 for the moment overwhelmed but when life is overwhelming our children their emotional immune system starts to become fevered it's ex it's it's almost the same it's a in that really case. good way to put it you know yeah. you know as a parent if they stayed up really late the day before, they were at a birthday party and they had too much sweets, you can, you know, you can backtrack and, and sort of figure out what's going on. Yeah. And you see, if and, and if the if we don't listen to the early signs of it and the and we just keep going with too much, with too many play dates, too much, too just too much, you know, to, just too much adult information, particularly too much TV, screens, iPads, just too much overwhelming their senses and they can't absorb it they start almost like they're taking in but they're just throwing it off in it like emotional uh, uh fever like an emotional sweat and they're tossing and they're turning emotionally so to speak then what happens is that problematic behavior starts dangerously moving towards disorders and there's no shortage of disorders waiting add odd pdd i mean there's no shortage of d's waiting yeah but what that d is and and after 30 years of working in this field now i fit, and we have over 1200 simplicity parenting coaches and group leaders around the world so we've trained 
a ton of people and we we get feedback from all every corner of the earth just about you know so this is not just my anecdotal observations this is this is the observations of a, of a small quiet little grassroots you know force <laughs> out yeah. there working for simplicity um and by the way that training was a simple little training it would be very ironic if it was complicated anyway the um the the feedback we get is fairly extensive and what what starts happening is that 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 disorderly behavior is the inflamed quirk right so so that so now the the busy child is now diagnosed with adhd which i think is such a silly name adhd it's not attention deficit it's attention excess i don't know who ever thought that name up it's Yes, but you anyway, talk about that in your book, that, they're, that right. they do a fine job. It's like misplaced attention. They do a fine yeah. job paying attention in, in certain situations, you so know, but maybe not your... sitting in a desk at school. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I call it attention priority issues. Yes. It's, just, it's just prioritizing attention. Their attention is perfectly fine, perfectly fine. It's just not, it's not calibrated with what the environment is asking of them at that moment. So to say to a child, you're not paying attention, is a disturbing statement to many kids because their their attention is on that building that bridge over the puddle, um, and they're paying perfect attention to that. Now the teacher is is talking about language arts, you know, whatever. But to say you're not paying attention is 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 a young child can't make sense of that. But that's another conversation. But mm -hmm. the what starts happening is a is the is the disorderly behavior is it's it arises it becomes inflexible so the quirk becomes fevered and rigid and what starts happening is that the child the busy child the now who's diagnosed with adhd or maybe one doesn't want to pathologize children which i'm a, a bit of a warrior at not pathologizing children but you know, you know, the behavior is just extraneous movement, can't settle, is agitated, is mistimed. Or the child who is just organized in their own funny little way, now they're rigid, they are, um, and that's more going towards OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. But what the, what the brain of that child is doing is it's pumping out adrenaline and cortisol and all the, all the allied, um, allied uh, um, hormones because they're in fight or flight. They're now just trying to, they're not living each day, they're trying to survive each day. They're trying to deal with the overwhelm of each day. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it basically, if we, what we've learned over 30 years and over tens and tens of thousands, and this book has reached, you know, whatever it is, a sort of million people, or whatever it is, um, I'm rather convinced, and through the studies we have done, is that if you start doing something that is highly within our within our grasp as parents and educators and therapists, particularly as parents, if we start to then, if, if we call it, if we trust our gut, because most the thing that I'm thrilled about, and I'm really hopeful, you know, because this is all a rather a dark picture, you know, the undeclared war in childhood. That's a rather dark picture, but. If more and more and more parents around the world are, tr are now trusting their gut instinct, saying yeah. something is wrong, Some, we never had to cope with this as kids, most of us, something is seriously off, something is wrong. That's the first thought. That's the, that's the very first helpful thought we can have is let that thought in, that something is off about life and what is being asked of these kids. And once we we go to our gut brain rather than our our cognitive, more head-based brain, once we go to our instinct, which is where two thirds of our of our brain, you know, into our intelligence dwell. Um, once we let that in and we stop looking around the neighborhood that all the other kids are doing this, we stop listening to the the sports coaches, well, they've got to train four nights a week. If we stop listening to the teachers who say they have to have two hours of homework a night and they're just 10, 11 years old and uh, um, and they have to and always have to, have to, we have to do all these things. 
once we actually step back and say, really, do, do we? Do we have to? That is a, a, a place that hundreds of thousands of parents are now starting to come to. And then if we start to unstress our children's lives and we look at it and say, what can we reduce? You know, this week there's, there's two play dates and a birthday party. Hmm. And there's practice for Little League soccer. Hmm. Let's make that just the party. The play date can wait. The soccer practice, you know what? Okay, we'll, we'll do. And we're going to have just two things, not four. I mean, right, right there is a, is a family cultural decision to start becoming almost judicious about almost like a gatekeeper. What do we allow into our child's nervous system? And what do we say no to? Or we say yes, and that can wait. You know, if our child's a little bit older and they want to do uh, soccer and basketball, to say, yes, yes, of course you can do that, love. It's so great you want to do that. And we do soccer this season. And then we, in the summer, we have a rest. And then in the fall, we do basketball. But we don't do soccer and basketball right on top of each other. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That kind of that kind of creative thinking is what people are doing all around the world now. Now here's Jenny. Here's the the thrilling thing. This is the thing that just I, I I eat you know after all these years of doing this, it still moves me when when I hear these stories from parents who are you know kind enough to contact me and say you know when we started to unstress our children's lives when we started to dial it back we felt like we got our little child back. We got our boy, little boy, our, our girl, our child. We felt like we got them back. And as we kept um, stressing, as we kept just giving, it's almost embarrassing to say this, but just giving them a childhood. It's not complicated. As we continue to give them a childhood, there, and this is the thing, that their quirk, which had become their disorder, is now their gift. That's their gift. That is that is their genius. You see, because the busy child who had become ADHD, their gift is their little warriors. You know, they but now their timing is they're saying the right thing at the right time to the right person at the right volume. Mm -hmm. Because now the amygdala is not driving them. The frontal lobes in the brain have been given a chance because it's not their system is not being bathed in fight or flight hormones. That busy child is now the mover and shaker. The children who wouldn't play with that hyperactive child because they were so unpredictable and kind of aggressive, now everyone wants to play with that child because they think of really cool ideas mm -hmm. yeah. and are inclusive, right? As opposed to being kind of crazy, kind of unpredictable, and really caught up in their, their own stuff. Mm -hmm. And that is the same child. I'm not, I'm not um, in any way pushing back against these diagnoses in one way, you know, in one way that they're not possible. You know, it's, it's, there's a difference between naming and knowing something, or I think of it as labeling and limiting. Labeling and limiting is pathologizing a child, but you can name something as, as a child who is just is, is being driven like just and once you calm their nervous system down that's their genius the child who was just organized in their own little way but was now headed towards ocd or the feisty one odd or whatever any any number of different um for example a, ch a child who was neurodiverse or autistic those children i mean the the the, the, the metaphoric garments they're clothed in if you know what i mean the filters between them and the world are very open weave these beautiful children that everything comes in they just they just take everything in well if a child who who is neurodiverse i prefer to use that language rather than autistic but if a child who is neurodiverse and they're taking everything in the highly sensitive child included then how wonderful that what what they take in be worthy 
I'm not suggesting we have them live in a bubble. I'm just suggesting we give these children a childhood and that we're, that we're somewhat mindful of what it is they're taking in. Are they taking in a bunch of violent media? Well, that's just like a neural toxicity, you know, to, to children. So, and so on and so on. Are we having unguarded conversations about world events and all the things that are happening in the world that are scary in front of the little child? Well, they're taking that in and their nervous system will become activated in not in a good way. You know, the whole sympathetic nervous system, the vagal pathways, all that stuff that some of your, your community might know about and have read about becomes very stimulated and activated because yeah. having unguarded conversations in front of children these days has again become the new normal. I, I think I think David Elkine talked about that in The Hurry Child, um, if I remember correctly, although it might be somewhere else, but talked about how, you know, in decades past and generations prior, parents were very concerned about the emotional safety of their kids and not so concerned about the physical safety of their kids. So kids would be outside playing for hours with no adult supervision, um, you know, for generations. And then, but if they came in the room and the radio was playing and it was something stressful, a radio program, they would turn it off or adults would start these conversations and then they would stop them if a child walked in. But then that it has flipped, you know, to now we're very concerned about physical safety. You know, kids are not playing. They're not, you know, allowed to climb or to do these, you know, uh, risky play behaviors, um, you know, mildly risky. Um, but but we have seemingly no concern for uh, their emotional safety anymore. And it's been a, a massive shift in our culture. There, there has been this this shift and and a lot of that. Um... I think a lot of that is not resting easy with us as parents anymore. I think there is an awakening happening yeah. um, uh, because this the, the the forces that are arrayed to um, to, to to actually uh, um, in a sense have ch I mean a lot of it is marketing forces that are arrayed to to sell family stuff to sell kids stuff is very very powerful. I'll give you a quick example, if I may. Um, I went to, for the last, gosh, five or more, six or seven years, I've tried to infiltrate a marketing conference, a marketing to children's conference, tried to go undercover. But every time I apply, I'm rejected because they it's a prestigious conference and all they have to do is look up my name and there I am and all, all these sort of, network television programs being rude about them, right? <laughs> I didn't even know there were these things. Wow. Oh, yeah. Yes, yes, marketing to children, absolutely. So um, recently I got into one because of, you know, it was online. So they mustn't have been checking so much. Anyway, I got into this conference and there were all the the big uh, market, you know, all the um, software designers, the um, uh, the breakfast cereal, the clothing companies, you know, to children, the app designers, the, the, the automakers, a lot of auto car makers were there and so on, because you probably know, it's well known now that if you can get brand loyalty before brand recognition before the age of three, uh, you'll get brand loyalty before the age of six. And that means a child will buy that brand of car when they come of age to buy, right? So they're, so, because that's when the brain is forming, right? So that's why you see these ads, I'm just picking cars as an example, that very often feature children in the, in the and then will flash from the children to the logo of the, the car brand or the cereal or the clothing brand or whatever. They're very, that, that, that information has been out there for a long time. But here's the thing that I discovered in this conference is that I followed I followed the feet where the where the little digital feet were going. And I went to these um, uh, workshops attended by several hundred people, this is a large group. And it was echoing the theme of the conference and the theme uh, and the, the theme of these workshops heavily attended by far the best attended workshops at this conference. Um, were um, the removal of purchasing friction. Now, do you know what purchasing friction is, Jenny? Can you guess? 
it's the new name makes it hard to buy it mm. you know or yeah, that's I, it. I don't know yeah i know no you're absolutely right um we have a new name as parents we are now called by marketers purchasing oh. friction. <laughs> what we are the purchasing friction yeah. <laughs> oh. okay <laughs> okay whoa we our our values are, we have to be and the the name of the workshop again was the removal of purchasing friction no less than the removal of family and parental love authority uh, authoritativeness and and values and and they were there were um tons of case studies because apparently this had began several conferences earlier and there were case studies being done into the successful removal of purchasing friction and they even wrote it parentheses aka parents wow the successful removal of parental influence wow now the way they do that is it through various means you know that if you buy this for your child your child's going to love you and just think you're the greatest person ever that's one way of doing it conversely the other way of doing it is to is to have influences where the children are told to circumnavigate and simply just ignore their parents and um and so th anyway there's a lot of information around that and they were very like little hands clapping on the screen like digital hands when they were presenting yeah. And they spend $16 billion a year marketing to children just here, just in the United States, $16 billion a year marketing to children. And 92% of all their, of, of their collective marketing budget is guess, guess what they spend it on. Screens. Yeah. Screens. Wow. So I have, a, I have a $16 billion hand. Because all I need to do is pull the plug out and I've just, that, that's a $16 billion hand right there. Wow, that's powerful. That's what I love about your, your book is that, I mean, you did specifically say, you know, you say balance is elusive, um, you know, in your book and that you know, to say simply simplify isn't as simple as it sounds, you know, however, um, you just give the best ideas. I, mean, I got emotional earlier while you were talking because I felt like, you know, you talk about that parents have this instinct, but sometimes we need, we need a book like yours that, that lays it out and, and talks about, I love this phrase that you say, the extraordinary power of less, you know, what a phrase. And so, um, you know, your book has the hope in it. Cause like you said, a lot of this is dark and a lot of it is overwhelming. Um, you know, you talk about societal pressure and, and, and obviously big business and, um, these marketing dollars, but, but that the answer, you know, is, is just to pull back and rhythms and, and, and you outline it in depth and um, make it very accessible in your book and make it exciting, you know? Well, you know, it's, it's one of those, just talking about the book, that the, 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 um, often people have, have kindly said to me, this is a very strange parenting book because uh, they haven't used those words, but that's what I, I, it is. Um, I'm not a big fan of parenting books, and I know that's weird because I write so many of them, but often parenting books subjugate us as parents like the book is primary and the book tells you what to do mm. and you feel like you're living inside someone's reality i was um uh, sitting at a dinner table once with, two, with a 10 and 12 year old girl and their mum and dad and the mum was speaking in a way that I, even i could hear was inauthentic she'd been reading some some parenting book Oh, yeah. And the two girls looked at each other and the older one said to the younger one, it's okay. She's re reading another parenting book. She'll be okay in a couple of weeks. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it's, but what this book, and I hope all the books I write, I, at least it's on my mind actively as I, as I write and as I do these workshops and lectures and such, is, is actually to, to make the parent and the parent's instinct, that's primary. 
the book is absolutely in service of. And this is a book, the one that we're talking about today, um, that doesn't ask a parent to do anything yeah. at all. It, it just asks them to do less. Less. And, and that's, I think that's the permission that we need. I mean, one of the things that you talk about is that, um, you know, that parenting has turned into a competitive sport. You say parents struggle to know how to slow down. You say we're accustomed. I actually think this is a really huge statement. You say we're accustomed to seeing our children's boredom as a personal failure. You yeah. know, and I think that that maybe is one of the key points, which is that it does feel like that. And I don't know why it feels like that. So we're just stuffing these calendars full um, instead of stepping back. But then you have just such wonderful information about boredom and how it leads child, you know, children to the best of things and, you know, to just give them time to unfold. And um, so, so it is this, you know, it's this pursuit of, of uh, balance in this pursuit of just having a breath and a pause in your life. And that's good for everyone. It's, it's really um, got to do with, with offering kids times of decompression, mm -hmm. like busyness, busyness is perfectly fine. You know, kids that get busy and excited and, 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 and are off to a play date that they just love. And they, that then they, you know, um, Older children, they they go off to their to this, to their to their you know sports club or gymnastics. It's all good. Everything's good. It's just too much good. It's just you know, it, um, it's all fine. But it's it's where do our children like we breathe? We breathe in. We breathe out. Where do the children's lives breathe in? Breathe out. It's very important that they have moments of decompression. Now, what do those moments of decompression look like, you see? Because it's almost, you know, it's interesting, Jenny, we could, again, what gives me hope, a lot of hope, is that in the past, children having a childhood was just kind of natural. And I don't, I don't mean to look at it through rose-colored glasses. It was just a part of the pace of life. We just didn't have the mechanisms available to us to speed it up so much. It wasn't always ideal by any means, but we, we just didn't have the mechanisms. Now we do. So what is really hopeful to me is that giving children a childhood has now gone from a wider cultural just norm to an individual family conscious cultural decision. Oh, that's huge. Yeah. That's a huge yeah. statement. Yeah. And, and we've got the power to do it. See, that's, yeah. that's the wonderful thing. Often we can see stuff that's disturbing, like in the face of, of war, for example, in the world, and war is brewing now, you know, and, it, and it's happening around the world. What can we do? Like as, as, as a mom or a dad, we look at that as, an, as a human being, we look at that and we can maybe take some baby steps and join some organizations, but not a lot. But in the undeclared war on childhood, oh my goodness, we can we can declare peace in our homes. Yeah, that is powerful. That right. is powerful. And I love I love this one. You know, you talk about I think it just hits to the heart of of what we want as parents. We want these slowed down experiences. You say in the tapestry of childhood, what stands out is not the splashy blowout trip to Disneyland, but the common threads that run throughout and repeat. The family dinner, you talk about Saturday morning pancakes. I mean, it's just so beautiful. Nature walks, reading together at bedtime. You know, and I think as parents to, to have that permission to know that that's enough, you know, and that's, and that's really what kids are clamoring for are, you know, moments of slow in their life and moments of connection. You know, it, it's, it's interesting, Jenny, because um, I, I, I've been very blessed in my life to travel to many different cultures, right? And I ask parents when I'm just sitting in just little circles with them, you know, I do a workshop and we do these little, and, and you know, they're, we're sitting together just talking. And I ask them about their golden memories. You know, I ask them, what's a golden memory from, from your childhood? Yeah. And in, um, in all these years, 
No one has ever talked about the splashy trip to D Disneyland. No one, not one person. And and I, I've asked tens of thousands of people. Our coaches have asked another hundreds of thousands of people. And I keep asking when we have our coach gatherings, and they're big, they're like big sort of jamborees. Um, has anyone heard about the big splashy thing yet? Do you know what people talk about? They talk about time in nature. That is yeah. like numb. Yes, no, I know it. Yeah, <laughs> we they, end. I, yes, I end all these podcasts with, um, it, with a favorite childhood memory outdoors, and, um, you know, as people are like, I, I loved walking through the dust and seeing the dust. You know, I mean, it's the simplest of things. You know, feeling my hand trickle through the cold water, and, um, it so it just gives you hope that as a parent that you know. Um, you can do these simple things and they can be so long lasting and have such an impact. Well, you see the time in nature is, is time to, it, it's almost like it gives a child a, a time to reset. It's a time to come back into themselves. It, it's a, it's a time to, to, to dare to dream. It's a time to c connect with this big, beautiful world that is so safe and securing. The other thing that people talk about is um, connection to friends. So there's nature, then there's connection to friends, and there's many stories about friends. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the third one, there's three that, that I've come to recognize as being three major themes, is connection to family. Yeah, that's beautiful. But all these things take time. Yeah. They take time. And if, if we can slow things down and allow time, um, it's like, it's a little bit like in the book Momo, uh, The Little Grey Gentleman by Michael Ender. He wrote, I love that book. There were these time bandits yes. who they figure out how to control society. The simplest way to control society is to steal their time. And then they roll it up and smoke it, by the way. But the um, but is to steal time is to make uh, my latest podcast. I do these little podcast things. They're just little ten minute simple little things. Yeah. And um, the last one is is called Rushy Rushy. That that, and because one mother said to me in China, um, uh, she we were at a break time, and she said to me, Kim, when Rushy Rushy comes in, then trouble comes in also. And she had this series of little sayings about rushy, rushy. But when we're not rushy, rushy, and she then would talk about all the beautiful connections that family. Now, it's not that children still won't be antsy and push back against us. But when they do, it's more yeah. malleable. Yeah. It's quicker. It, 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 it's quicker to bring back in. Now, if, if this is we come back to boredom a little bit. Because if we allow decompression time and allow and give the kids what I call, as you probably saw in the book, the gift of boredom, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Then they'll just kind of, because one of the things that boredom does is that it's the precursor to creativity. It's the precursor to adaptability. It's the precursor to innovation. Because we're not presenting our kids. We're not saying, oh, they're bored. Okay, let's get them into another club. Let's get the play date. I'll, I'll just see if I can organize. Hang on, where's the iPad? I'll put the iPad on. Let's have another show. Just let them be bored. Now, the reason boredom and decompression and downtime is so important, on a body-based level, it allows, it allows the neural toxins to actually clear the system and allows a child to reset every single day, several times a day. But on a, but now if I can move that out, if I may, to a much bigger um, scale, by the, by 2035, and that's coming up relatively quickly, mm -hmm. over 75%, three quarters, according to the trade department, will be headed in that direction where jobs, where, where the, the, the way in which we earn our income, like when our kids are adults, yeah. is what I'm saying, yep. a vast majority of the way they will earn their living will be unemployed, will be self-employed, will be project-based, um, will, will be um, part-time, 
and what's often called tapestry employment, like a, a, a or collage employment, a number of things that the, the kids put together. Okay, now, what's that got to do with right now? Well, here's, to answer my own question, because they're always the easiest, um, what that's got to do with now is that when we allow our kids to have downtime, to be bored, that's when the innovation comes up. That's when the adaptability, the creativity. Now, if anyone listening today is ever been self-employed and you ask self-employed people, what does it take to be successful? These three words, creativity, innovation, adaptability, always come up. And a fourth word often comes up, and that's grit and problem solving. Anyone who's been self-employed, part-time, putting it together, knows that this is what it takes because no one gets you up in the morning. Right. No one's going to problem solve for you. No one tells you, you what to do next. No one. Yeah, right. it's all you are coming up with this out of your own volition. That is what, you know, and how do children gain that? They gain it through boredom. They gain it through then coming up for them. So I'm not doubting screens, for example, are creative, but there's someone else's creativity. That, that, is, that is how child passively watching someone else's creativity. That is, for the most part, not their creativity. It's just not. See, sometimes people say to, to me and our coaches and group leaders, simplicity is like, oh, that's going back into the past. Oh, that's sweet. That's cute. That's going back into the past. And I really beg to differ. It is not. Oh, it is that's actually, so good. It it's is preparing so, them for the future. It is for the future. Wow. Because that is, the, that is what the future is, not might. That is what it will, according to the data, not just my anecdotal experience, that is what is coming down the pike to our kids. So in giving them a childhood, in allowing them to build time, to build tree forts, which takes a lot of time because that, well, that fort, it collapses three or four or five times before they get it right. And then it's really cool. But if you talk to someone in business, apparently the figures in business are that for every 10 ideas, seven fail. But for every 10 tree forts you build, seven fall down. Mm -hmm. right? It's preparing them. And, mm -hmm. I, and I love what you say about how, and I think this, this is a big thing too, is that in the long run, this makes parenting easier. You, you talk about, you say, Here's what you say. The rich and diverse habits. What your do children, I say? What do I this say? This is so Jean? good. I love this part. <laughs> I got so many notes here. This book is so good. The rich and diverse habits your children will develop without television will serve them well throughout their lives. It will also simplify your parenting enormously over the long haul because your kids will find deep inner wells of creativity and resourcefulness. Better, more reliable babysitters do not exist. Oh, that, that, that is good. I don't even remember That's writing. Good. That good. But it does. It makes mm -hmm. parenting easier. You know, when, when we have the television on and I, when I found your book, my kids were toddlers. And, and so I noticed that, you know, if I have the television on, you know, that 22 minutes just flies by for me. I don't get done what I'm expecting to get done. And then I cannot pull them out of it. They're crying. They're upset. They don't want to turn it off. They want to do another one and another one. And what I found is that it's easier to just not do it at all. You know, and, and I'm not, and we are not anti-screen by any means. You know, we're trying to, to bring back balance and, and, to, and to guard space in the calendar for play and, and to be outside. But, um, you know, I, I agree with you that the best babysitter is, is when a child can, can play. But Jenny, what I hear you saying, if I can, if I can put it this way, is that you're not anti-screen, you're just pro-connection. Yeah. It's not anti-screen, it's pro-childhood. Mm -hmm. It's not against anything, it's standing for connection to nature. Because the average American child in, 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 in well, to North America, the average North American child, this is way back, okay, I'll give you two figures. In 2011, 2011, like 11 years ago now, um, 
the Kaiser Family Foundation study released the figures that the average um, North American 12-year-old, 8 to 12-year-old, uh, and then through they took it through into the teens, is um, watches seven and a half hours of screens per day. Per day. Yeah. Now, the Common Sense Media Foundation followed that up. 2018, I believe the study was, it's now risen to nine and a quarter hours per day. Now, it's... Okay, so there's a lot of toxic stuff going on with screens. It, we know it affects our the myelination of the brain, uh, the learning habits study, 55,000 kids over 15 years. I mean, the jury is in that, that, that screens are not good for our kids' brain development. It's it just, that is, that is not just selective cherry picking of research. That, that is like, just, just fact. Very few things can just be like, okay, that is just the way it is. Mm -hmm. But the um, but much more or equally as concerning to me is that if a child's watching just two hours of screen a day, right, just not nine and a quarter, but even if it's a couple of hours of screen, that or that's a couple of hours that they're not spending problem solving, not spending socializing, spending with their brothers and sisters working things out with them, with their dad, baking or whatever, just establishing warm human connection. Yeah. That is two hours they've just spent being subjected to the removal of purchasing friction. Yeah. Wow. Well, it, it's just, it's such an imbalance. And I think that is, you know, one of the main points is, have you heard the statistic about, um, it's from the National Wildlife Federation, that um, the average amount of time, uh, um, North American, it might be, it might be in the US, but the average amount of time that kids are playing freely outside in nature. Have you heard this stat? Yeah, drop, it's, dropping down. It's four to seven minutes a day. Four to and seven then, minutes. Now, a day, yeah. four to seven minutes, and put that alongside nine and a quarter hours on a screen. Yeah. All you and I, I guess, are saying, and the people who are tuning in are saying, is can we get that back in whack, please? Yeah. Can we get that? If things can be out of whack, can things be in whack? Anyway, I don't know, Jenny, I don't know American yes. saying, yes. but can we get but can we get that back? Yes. Can we just can yes. we do something? And that about is that this? is actually our mission, which is to balance nature and screen time. And and like you talk about, this is simple. It's not easy to implement, but the but the idea is simple. And so we get the same feedback, which is like, this has changed my life. This has changed childhood simply by leaving space, by opening up space for our kids. Yeah, you know, uh, one of the uh, um, uh, my colleagues, a, a woman, a medical doctor, Victoria, Victoria Dunkley, uh, it's, it's been quite influential on me. Her work, her, her book is called uh, Reset Your Child's Brain. And what she does, Victoria Dunkley, it's D-U-N-C-K-L-E-Y. Maybe you can put that in the show notes because yes. it's, it's a wonderful website. It's a wonderful book. Uh, just about every parent I work with, and I still have you know, a, a family uh, you know, parent coaching and counseling practice to this day. Like after we finish talking, I'll be speaking with uh, you know, a half a dozen parents today. You know, that's, that's what I do. And um, just... A, I'd say sort of at a guess, five or six out of 10 parents that I work with, when they call me saying, you know, there's behavioral problems, there's issues going on. If those parents have children exposed to screens, I ask them to take the one month brain reset mm. and coach them in how to do that, how to walk onto it, how to do it sensibly. And just yesterday, actually, a parent just said, it is astonishing the difference in behavior. And I, uh, I'll put something up in the coming weeks on our website. Her, what she said was so crystal clear. She said, my child's behavior has now become softer, more gentle. The sibling rivalry and fighting that was going on, which was intense, has now, and she said, stopped. And I said, stopped. And she said, stopped. And, and she said, the, the children already, their schoolwork is improving. Now, a lot of this, we shouldn't be surprised because we're moving the children from, from dopamine addiction. And let's make no mistake, screens are designed to be addictive, mm -hmm. right? 
the dopamine levels, the pleasure, the reward, the quick pleasure and reward loops. Once we free the brain from dopamine addiction to the frontal lobes, of course our kids' grades are going to go up. Of course, their social and emotional intelligence and interactions with others is going to improve. Mm -hmm. It should not be surprising to anyone when we release a, a child from an addictive cycle, a compulsive at the very least, like you were saying, Jenny, you turn it off and you get almost like a withdrawal reaction from kids. Wow, when that is it. Right. And wow. so Victoria Dunkley's work is basically saying, Free your kids from this for 28 days and then make a decision about whether you want to go back into it. And in all these years of doing, I used to do a screen reset uh, quite a long time before Victoria wrote this book, but her work in it is, is much more elegant than mine. And she really uh, you know, has figured this out. And she's a very respected medical doctor, you know, and she's been quite influential. Um, I haven't yet come across a parent who has gone back to heavy screen use for their kids. Most say it's gone, it's out, we're not doing it. And then, and then my advice always is to reintroduce screens slowly as the kids get older, around 12, 13, as a tech tool, not a tech toy. Yeah. So it's a tech tool. And how to and coach them in because again I'm not anti-screen. I used to teach information technology and computer science in high school. I, I'm, I'm not anti-screen. It's the right thing, and we've known this for years. It's the right thing at the right age in the right way at, at the right amount of time. Yeah. That's all. That's all we're talking about here. Um, yeah. And after that third 28-day reset, um, most parents say. It's gone. There are some parents of young children who'll say, well, we'll just have movie night on Fridays. Now, when, and that's perfectly fine. You're like, of course. But when you do that and you introduce a little bit of dopamine, I, I always counsel those parents, be very careful of screen creep. It's what I call screen creep. Yeah, Is that that's it, good. It'll move out. And, uh, and if you can hold it to being, you know, really just that until you make a very conscious decision, extremely conscious about, okay, we're going to increase it to this. Don't allow it to creep because dopamine, dopamine compulsions and addictions, they walk in very quiet feet mm. and they, they, they move out into your life more and more and more. Yeah. So that's that's Victoria Dunkley's work, okay. and it's very aligned with the work you're you're doing, Jim. Yeah, I'm excited to look into it. Well, you know, Kim, I do a lot of these interviews, and and so often, you know, it runs the gamut of someone's book, um, but this has only scratched the surface. Truly, I mean, I have all this stuff here. You know, and we're running out of time, but. Um, you know, so I just, I really highly recommend Simplicity Parenting. You have another book coming out and you have, you have seven other books besides this one, besides Simplicity Parenting, but you have a new book coming out this June called Emotionally Resilient Teens and Tweens, uh, which just seems like the most timely title uh, to, to be coming out this year. Can you tell us a little bit about that book? Yeah, that book uh, arose that I co-authored with with my dear friend and colleague Luis Fernando Yosa. Um, he, we team up. We also teamed up in in the book Beyond Winning: Smart Parenting in a Toxic Child and Youth Sport Environment. So we took on the whole toxic sports for children and how to make that healthy. Uh, in this book, uh, The Emotionally Resilient Tweens and Teens, um, we take on the, the, the topic of, marge, of kids that are dehumanized, kids that are marginalized, kids that are, uh, are, are teased, are bullied, mm -hmm. are pushed to the edges uh, of friendship groups, kids who are cyber bullied, kids who are not included. And what we do is that we give very, very specific um, uh, help to parents in how to coach their kids into how to how to break the cycle of disempowerment, how to how to stand within their own power, and how to be much more resilient to a lot of the pressures socially that are coming at kids that age. Yeah. And then that's the first half of the book. And then the second half of the book is ten stories, real stories, uh, in with real dialogue. 
that parents, and I've been using these for years and years, where parents can take one, like a, like a, a topic, um, let's say it's of rumor spreading, um, like a lot of, of uh, a lot of marginalization, teasing, and, and I don't tend to use the term bullying a lot. The term I use is hyper controlling behavior because that's what hyper control. Yeah. And we, in these stories, we give um, it's and they're the um, I hope well crafted stories of how a young they're told through the voice of a 18, 19 year old looking back at when they were 10, 11, 12, 9, at what their situation was about rumors being spread, about being cyber bullied, about being excluded from a friendship group, about trying too hard to fit in, about all that stuff that goes on in these years and how what they did made it worse, it made it much worse. And then a point of realization and then how they made it better by themselves with their parents beside them so it's not relying on the school to step in it's it, i find that that is a long a long wait for most kids um yes. i don't mean to be critical of schools but it's much more powerful to coach our own child up and to work with them to figure it out and for them to stand strong in an environment where they're being excluded from the friendship group or whatever it is um and then it brings our connection to our kids so, so much closer. So these stories, see, stories are a way to reach children, not just talk, but these. Yeah. And then to, to read the story with a child, with a tween, with a teen, and then to sit down and talk about what in that story could you do? What's in that story for us? And then, wow. and then the child goes out and actions those points. And usually the marginalization, the so-called bullying, Usually it'll stop within about seven to ten days. It's done. It's over. It's 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 in the it's in the rearview mirror. Wow, is that powerful? This book it, is needed. Yeah, yeah. Needed. It's it's been it's long overdue. Uh, in in yeah. if I may say, and um, yeah, that's it was a bit of a and I wonder how it'll go because it's 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 a little tiny bit of a, I had to cross my fingers and leap writing this book because I wrote it in stories like really. Um, a full more slightly more than half of the book is stories 10 stories of different marginalizations and different emotional struggles and how to be how to overcome them it reminds me of what you said earlier about the mom that's at the restaurant and she's sort of just spitting back parenting information but we learn so much through stories and i think we connect to them and then it helps the child to remember oh this kid did that and so i can you know try these tools so I'm, i really hope we can have you back you know uh to talk about that book um you know closer to the summer and uh we always end with, um, we could be real quick here, but a favorite real life, um, you know, de-stress, childhood, slow outdoor memory of yours. Oh, um, one that immediately come is being uh, down at the, at the river with, um, with my father and um, there were reeds growing up by the river and some were green and some further back were dry and making these amazing tunnels, literally uh, weaving in the, 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 um, the, the reeds, making these tunnels through the reeds and making these big openings of rooms and spending days doing this and then inviting my dad to climb in with me. Now he was far too big, but so he got on his belly and crawled in and then sat like a little gnome in, in in this in my in my big room that I had made. So it's both a memory of many many hours designing these designing you know my palace as I called it. Um, it had a lookout. There was a tree growing up, so there was a lookout. My dad even got up that with me too up the tree. Um, but it's a memory of nature, but it's also a memory of of, of my dad. Um, doing and, and, of, and of connection to my to my wonderful father. Yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. One of the um, one of the quotes you have in your book <clears throat> that I want to end with because I think it's so profound. You say, "Rescue their childhood from stress, and they will inevitably 
remarkably day by day rescue you right back and i think that i think that at the crux of it lies this better life for all of us it's for the kids um, but then that permeates into our family life into our adult life as well so um, simplicity parenting using the extraordinary power of less to raise calmer happier and more secure kids kim thank you from the bottom of my heart for your work um, for your influence and for taking this time with us today oh it is so lovely to talk to you jenny and, and all power to the work that you're doing too it's remarkable Thank you.